I'm ready for winter. Look at that, there we are. Hey, Jay. Hello, Jeff. This is just like at the World's Fair, picture phones. And welcome to NASJ's uh, preseason media briefing. Um, really, this is our first preseason media briefing that we've ever done on Zoom. It's not the same as seeing you all in person, but there's one advantage uh, to come out of this health crisis, if there's one advantage to come out of it, is, is we can all meet virtually and do so wherever we are. We don't have to dress much for the occasion. Don't ask me to stand up. Um, I'd like you all to mute yourself. You'll hear a lot more about that word mute during the presidential debate tonight, and we'll be done before the fireworks begin. Uh, your questions, if you have questions for any of our uh, presenters, please uh, send those by chat. Uh, our media panel today is uh, Marie Pierre. Uh, Marie Pierre. MP. MP. Uh, MP. She's a NASH, new NASJ board member, and she's a Canadian freelancer. And Maura McCarthy, who we all know for years. She Boston Herald, Ski Magazine, and uh, Ski Area Management. Uh, here's a plug for NASJA. If you're a guest on this call and you haven't yet joined NASJA, we encourage you to do so. Membership information can be found at nasja.org. We have a series of uh, safe virtual events planned, including um, professional development. And I'm proud to announce that Tom Kelly is going to work with us next month on a professional development seminar on the subject of backcountry skiing safety. The idea here being that uh, uh, many people may take another look at backcountry because of issues with reservations and parking, and uh, they may not be prepared for what to expect in the backcountry. And so our professional development seminar next month will try to address that. As far as meetings are concerned, we're hopeful we can do a Western Winter Summit that's going to be in late January uh, to Utah. We're looking to return to Big Snow America, which I understand is opened again. Um, and we still also have on the books the Ski History Week at Snowmass. It's April 7th to 11th. But we keep foremost in our mind that nothing is worth compromising our health, not even skiing. So let's all pray for science and that vaccine. And not the Russian one, the, the, the real one. <laughs> um, our members are being called upon like never before to make some sense out of the current. Mm -hmm. And we know our ski resort friends are doing what they can to provide skiing and riding and cross country as safely as they can because when it comes down to it, they're skiers as well. <clears throat> we hope in the next hour to have some more clarity on the subject. All presentations are on the record. We are recording this, and those recordings will be made available to those that, uh, that ask for them. Um, I've asked that our presenters limit their presentations to six minutes. I will be timing you. Uh, stopwatch, there you go. Um, and reminding you um, uh, when one minute is left. Just to stay on, uh, on track. I'm very proud to kick this off with our representative from Ski New Hampshire, Shannon Dumphy Ball. She's marketing and communications manager for Ski New Hampshire. That's New Hampshire's nonprofit private ski area trade association representing 30 Alpine and cross country ski resort members. And by the way, we have 51 participants on this call, which I think is great. So Shannon, take it away. Hi Jeff, thank you. And thank you to all the media members who are joining tonight. Again, my name is Shannon Dunphy Ball. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager for Ski New Hampshire. Um, as I have six minutes, bear with me. I'm going to try not to talk too quick, but I do have a lot to get in here. Um, so again, New Hampshire, it's in New England, the Northeast of the United States of America. Um, we're best known for variety within proximity. New Hampshire is a small state. But with that, um, we have a lot of proximity between all of our ski areas with terrain, altitude, different size mountains, family friendly, um, a lot with some serious vert for expert skiers. And then again, most importantly, proximity to all points in New England because we're sort of in the middle of New England. So it's pretty easy to get to us. And then once you're here, it's really easy to set up a base camp and then to go to multiple ski areas while you're on your vacation. 
Um, this year specifically, New Hampshire has been fairly open compared to our neighboring northern New Hampshire or northern New England states. Um, so if you're from New England, you don't have to quarantine to come to the state of New Hampshire for your vacation or for a day trip. Um, if you're from outside of New England, you, we ask that you're quarantining for 14 days before your arrival. And that's not the ski industry is asking, that's the state of New Hampshire. Now on to some protocols. These are just sort of general protocols that um, I think most of you, uh, most of you would want to know about and specifically uh, guests would want to know about. Firstly, um, guests will have to wear face coverings. So mostly inside lodges, retails, uh, rental shops, places like that. Also in lift lines, on lifts, and while loading and unloading lifts. So basically any time where that six feet of physical distancing, this isn't possible. Again, social distancing will have to be practiced as well. Not just inside, but outside. So when you're skiing normally, it's, you don't really want people near you, so that's easy but it's more of those touch points. So um, let's talk lifts specifically. So people will mostly be riding with members of their own party, and that would be defined as whoever you arrived at the ski area with. Um, we're actually working on editing our guidance to say that people could choose to sit with unrelated parties as long as there's a seat in between them. But at the moment, um, our guidance reads that you are only to ride with members that you, you arrived with. Mm. Uh, you can also expect to see ghost lanes, which would be six foot lanes in between um, to the left and the right of you. So you have some distancing side to side and not just front to back. Mm -hmm. The next part gets a little interesting. We're asking people to boot up in their car and to bring only essentials with them on the trails. I imagine you have many questions about this. Um, it's not so easy for me to answer. It's definitely more of a ski area specific question. But uh, generally, um, we're asking for people not to bring their boot bags in and leave them in the lodges. And the reason for this is not because we're worried about germs on bags. It's literally because our resorts are trying to limit the amount of people and the amount of time spent inside lodges, if that helps to clarify it. Um, we were also pushing people to look into buying tickets and passes online and in advance. Um, most ski areas who have the ability to do so will be either encouraging or only selling tickets online to avoid those lines at the ticket windows. Um, in New Hampshire, we have a lot of small ski areas. So it's actually, uh, we will have a lot of ski areas that won't necessarily offer that. So in lieu of buying something online, we ask that you visit ski area websites and just generally look at their uh, policies that are specific to their location. Uh, regarding reservations to ski on any specific day, um, the only resorts in New Hampshire that I know of right now, as of today, are the Vail properties that are doing mm -hmm. this. So those would be Crotched, Adatash, Wildcat, and Mount Sunapee. Um, the last two you have definitely heard about a lot since June, and that is clean your hands regularly. Um, so that's mostly when you're inside. If you're outside, just wear your gloves or your mittens, and stay home if you're feeling sick. So preparation by guests will come as a result of the resorts communicating to them. And it's not just the resorts. Oh, thanks. Um, Ski New Hampshire has been working on that too, and we're working with the Department of Tourism for the state of New Hampshire and other organizations like Chambers and DMOs trying to get the word out. It's all about know before you go this year. Finally, you can go to skinh.com and that will have a rundown of everything I just <laughs> said to you. You're going to be looking for our Ski NH COVID-19 Consumer Resource Center. It's a web page and I'll have all the links that you're going to want to know. New Hampshire guidance, out-of-state uh, visitor guidance, and then general New Hampshire guidance. All right, thank you. Shannon, thanks so much. Um, let me restart this. And Adam, Adam White is up. Adam White is Director of Communications for Ski Vermont. 
Ski Vermont serves 20 Alpine and 30 cross country member resorts in three major areas. They serve them in government affairs, marketing, and public affairs. Adam, so good to see you again. Great to see you as well, Jeff. Uh, thanks everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak to you. Uh, so as not to be super redundant, um, all of our regulations are the same as New Hampshire's. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to our website. I would highly recommend you go to skivermont.com. The very first thing that you will encounter there is our travel planning and COVID-19 page, which in addition to having all of the same types of links and resources, it has individual links to every one of our Alpine member areas so that you can see their policies immediately. Uh, and then also the links to the some of the state websites and things like that. But uh, in all seriousness, yes, a lot of the regulations are gonna be very similar. So I will try not to be uh, uh, too redundant here. Uh, one caveat though that I have to mention is we've been working hand in glove with uh, different state agencies over the past six months or so on our reopening plan, uh, Commerce and Community Development, Department of Health, tourism, governor's office, you know, right down the row. And uh, today was supposed to be the day of the governor's uh, press conference to announce the, the uh, approval of our reopening plan and it got uh, pushed back. So I do have to warn you that uh, any of the, and all of these regulations that I may talk about here are subject to change uh, based on that final approval. So that said, uh, in all likelihood, what you're gonna see uh, is a very simple situation that you just heard about from New Hampshire um, on that ballot. That's one of the things that I think will be an effective ballot. One of the only things that can really go wrong. Someone's not muted. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, physical distancing will be key. Uh, masks and face coverings uh, pretty much at all times. Uh, observe all and obey all signage and employee direction is really important. Uh, know before you go is really going to have to be the steadfast rule uh, because on top of the state regulations, you're going to have individual uh, ski area protocols. And if there's one thing that anyone who's worked in this industry knows, there's no such thing as one size fits all. Every ski area is different in terms of the scale of its operation, the way it's laid out, uh, the way its space is used, everything. So you can't just think that you know one rule that's gonna then apply to every ski area that you go to. So you, you, it's imperative that you do the research ahead of time and know before you go. Um, I also, it would be remiss for me not to mention the interstate travel regulations. Vermont, uh, as most of you know, has the most stringent interstate travel regulations in the country. Uh, hmm. We have now become sort of the national standard for containing uh, the COVID-19 virus and uh, we're very proud of that here, and that will continue to be the case. Um, as a result, there are very strict interstate travel regulations linked on that webpage that I just mentioned that uh, people are going to need to read and understand and adhere to. Uh, far and away, the biggest question I have gotten in the last few weeks and even months has been about the travel regulations, and those questions have come from two camps, in-state and out-of-state. The in-state people all wanna know, are the travel regulations going to be enforced? Uh, and hoping that they will be. And all the out-of-state people say, are the travel regulations gonna be enforced? Because they're hoping that they're not. So uh, the reality is we all have a shared responsibility in this situation to know and adhere to those rules is what I tell people. Um, enforcement will be difficult. It's not impossible, but it will be difficult. And uh, Largely the onus for that will fall on the lodging establishments. So if you're coming from out of state and checking into a lodging establishment, you can expect there to be uh, some protocols that you're gonna have to adhere to. Um, but the, the important thing to stress here is that the importance of preventing an infection far outweighs the importance of going skiing. And I know that may sound odd based on the industry that I work in, but uh, our, our state simply cannot sustain a significant outbreak and our industry can't sustain a significant outbreak. I mean, it wouldn't take much to take down a ski area where you to get an infection among vital staff that can't be immediately replaced due to certifications and things of that nature. So it is imperative that everyone follows these regulations uh, to the best that they can. The rest of it's pretty much common sense. Wash your hands, don't touch your face, uh, avoid congregating, you know, uh, apre and things of that nature it's not going to be the season for that. It's going to be a lot of go back to your hotel and uh, tune in virtually. And uh, we're, 
we're, we're hoping to do some online virtual app price stuff. That'll be a lot of fun. We've got some stuff cooking in that regard. Um, certainly uncharted territory, but we're seeing it as an opportunity to kind of expand into some of that stuff, which should be pretty cool. Um, <laughs> But what we're stressing is kind of what NSAA is stressing, and that is uh, they have this uh, ski well, be well program, and they say be the reason that we have a season. And that's what we're hoping people will embrace is that shared responsibility that we're all going to have uh, into playing a part here. So again, we recommend you uh, go online and do your research ahead of time. This is not the, the season for impromptu uh, car trips and powder chasing and walking up to the ski window, your ticket window to buy your ticket day of that sort of thing. So, um, you know, educate yourself ahead of time, know what you're doing and uh, we can all continue to have a season. And that's really the best that we can hope for. And that, with that, I have at almost exactly six minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adam. You're welcome. Now, these are the people that put the North, North American Snow Sports Journalists Association. We'll start with Paul Pinchbeck. He's president and CEO of the Canadian Ski Council. And the goal of the Canadian Ski Council is to increase participation in recreational snowboarding, alpine, and cross-country skiing in Canada, something we can all enjoy once uh, the travel restrictions are open up. Paul. Paul. Thank you very much, Jeff. That's a, that's a heck of an introduction. It's a pleasure to, uh, to address everybody here. Some I know, some I hope to know uh, even better as we move forward. Uh, you know, for my six minutes, they're going to sound a lot like uh, my, the prior two presenters. Uh, it, skiing in Canada will be, uh, without any word of an understatement, a, a very different experience. Uh, this season, uh, certainly, uh, we're expecting to uh, to espouse the the uh, the principles of know before you go. That's where everything will start, because we do have uh, unique situations, resort to resort and province to province, when it comes to uh, to restrictions. Uh, certainly, we've managed to line the industry up together on uh, on the basic practices: mask wearing, uh, face coverings, and lift lines. Uh, disinfecting your hands, disinfecting surfaces, uh, and of course our two meter or two hockey stick, or perhaps better yet, a, uh, a six foot uh, <laughs> distance between every uh, every skier indoors and while in lift lines. And, and I think is, you know, the key there is that we are trying to make sure that that is a universally understood and respected uh, situation. Uh, the prior presenter mentioned the uh, ski well, be well, and the concept of don't be the reason that we can't have a season. Well, that's very much something that we're trying to bring to the public now because we feel very, uh, very sure that we can deliver a great season if everybody plays together, everybody respects the rules, and that we are uh, able uh, to to uh, to play within those rules. I think we're we're setting up for a great season. Uh, you know, ultimately, I know that we can expect managed interior space, managed rental spaces, lots of uh, lots of uh, of, uh, of restrictions in that situation. For the most part, we are advocating and receiving acceptance on uh, on uh, keeping our lifts loading to capacity. Uh, there will be situations where that may change as as COVID cases change, as uh, as provinces and or regions within provinces. Uh, get into uh, into higher case counts or or the reverse as they lower their case counts because we're all playing by the same rules. Um, we're in the United States. You seem to be talking a lot about uh, about intra uh, excuse me intrastate travel and the restrictions there. Other than our closed north south border and the restrictions that we have with respect to international travel, at the current mm -hmm. time we do not have any serious. Uh, intra-provincial travel restrictions that that affect our uh, our situation. You probably have all heard, those of you from the Northeast, about the Atlantic bubble. And uh, and certainly we do have ski areas down in the Atlantic bubble, but they tend not to be ones that are, uh, that are uh, importing skiers from Quebec, Ontario, and the West. So we're, we're really trying to make sure those borders stay open as we, uh, as we move into this season. And actively communicating it to people. Jeff mentioned that we're, uh, we're all about growing the sport. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to say that our programs, the key, key program, which is called the Grade 4 or 5 Snow Pass, uh, the national program that gets families out uh, skiing and riding, will continue this year. And we expect our Never Ever Days efforts, which are focused on diversity, to continue. So, you know, we've worked really hard with our resorts to, to adapt our programs and work with their guidance to make sure that we're still able to fulfill 
uh, the growing the sport functionality. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I'm very happy to say that I think we're well positioned, all things considered, to be uh, to, to take advantage of what Canada saw as a boom in outdoor travel, outdoor activity, uh, away from team sports and indoor sports. So I always hate to, to, uh, to benefit at someone else's uh, loss. I, you know, I would prefer that people could still go to the gym or the swimming pool. But I think we prevent, we present, and I'm sure that this is going to happen south of the border as well. We skiing presents an opportunity to be outside and to be active this winter, and and we're looking forward to receiving as many people as we can. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, continuing our uh, travel across Canada, uh, Eves, as you know, is from Quebec Skiers Association. It's a nonprofit umbrella association represents all of Quebec's ski resorts. And they, I didn't know this, they have 75 ski areas in operation in Quebec. Uh, its mission is to promote the resorts, defend their interests, develop the next generation and support the industry in an effort to offer skiers and snowboarders memorable mountain experiences. Boy, I could use a few of those this year. Uh, Eve, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, I've been a longtime friend of uh, Nasja. It's fun to see uh, Dave Leonardi here on the camera. Usually it's at the Philadelphia Flyers game that we see you. So <laughs> it's a nice change. So uh, it's, it's great to see you back. Um, so in Quebec, in La Belle Province, uh, we have, we've been the first uh, uh, province in Canada that got the okay from the government to uh, open our ski areas and to, uh, to put in place the measures for, the, uh, for, for COVID. Uh, one of the things I'd like to share with you is that we have a fairly complicated uh, system. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so you see the province right now is uh, divided into alert levels. So it's kind of tough for everybody to understand what it means and how things work out. And uh, one of the worries we have is definitely uh, what will happen to our ski season if we are in uh, red alert level. The good news is in the announcement that was made uh, last week, um, we are going to be able to operate our ski areas even if you are at maximum alert level. So the measures will vary and you can see now if you if I scroll, scroll down the screen yeah. that uh, even within each region you have sub-regions. So basically you need to have a master's degree in geography to really understand everything that's gonna happen. So it's gonna be a key for us, for ski areas and for the association to really educate people into uh, how the season will enroll at our ski areas. Um, you know, my, my colleagues from New Hampshire and Vermont said that uh, the key will be to uh, prepare in advance and that's definitely what's going to happen for us in Quebec. One of the other things that um, I wanted to share with you is, is our actual uh, setup for uh, the measures that we will have um, um, this season. So we have the regular ones, but in Canada and Quebec, you know, it's uh, in Quebec, it's not feet it's meters so it's not that the di social distancing is sor shorter you know six feet is two meters so we're going with uh yeah. with two meters that's that's how it works but um the other than that it's the regular hand washing all of those uh different things that you're already familiar with but we do have a chart and if you want to check it out it's available on our website at uh, mysnow.ski and one of the good things is that the, the um, measures are consistent when you're through the first, second and third level. So uh, green, yellow and orange. The only difference uh, for those three levels is uh, what we call inter-regional travel. So um, there is a restriction if you're from the uh, orange level or the red level. Um, the government is saying that it's not recommended to travel from one zone to the other, but it's not forbidden. And it's not going to be the ski area's responsibility to, uh, to, to, uh, to oversee 
uh, the, the visitor's um, uh, uh, point of origin. So we're going to rely uh, greatly on individual responsibilities for people to really understand the rules and, and obey them, respect them, apply them. So our role is going to be to communicate them, to put them in place, but it's a shared responsibility between skiers and uh, and resort operators. And that's why you guys are so key because we need to educate the public with how our behaviors at Skirias will need to adapt to this uh, incredible situation. So the inter-regional travel is really an, an important issue. Mm -hmm. It's hard right now to explain to everybody. Basically what we're saying is if you come from a red alert level like the metro metropolitan uh, Montreal area and mm -hmm. go to Tremblant where it's located in the orange level you're supposed to keep the same behavior that you would have at home so at home restaurants are not open but at the ski resort the restaurant the restaurant is open so you, you would be supposed not to go to Tremblant's restaurants so mm -hmm. Are you still following me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's pretty tricky. It's pretty tricky. So we're, we're going to have a tough time uh, explaining that to people, but the plan is there. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is um, other than the, um, the um, inter-regional travel is mm -hmm. uh, face covering. So people will be required to wear a face mask inside but have a second uh face cover for outside which can be uh you know um uh a neck warmer something yeah. like that and it's for everybody uh over three years old so it will allow us to operate lifts at full capacity uh, mm. with that measure unless the ski area is in the red alert system for instance Mount Saint Anne and Le Massif right now are under that alert level. So yeah. in that case, um, we ask people to use the lift with their immediate uh, family, so their their bubble, if you want. That's a concept we have here in in uh, Quebec, and we only have a capacity restriction for uh, gondolas. So mm -hmm. that's those are the main things. And then if you go on the red level, some of the services uh, get cut down. And the bad news, I guess, is for all those racers out there. Uh, if uh, you are uh, coming from a red alert level region or going to a ski area that's in the red alert, and what's allowed is basically ski as an individual sport. So you can ski freely but you cannot um, ski uh, with your team, with uh, any competition or anything like that. So that's, Thank you, we, we, that's, uh, that's what's happening here in Quebec. Thank, Thank you. you. I can't believe we're talking about this. I thought the gas crisis in the 70s was tough. For <laughs> this is a whole new category. Um, Vern Greco, CEO, Pacific Group Resorts. He represents WISP. Mount Washington in British Columbia, Wintergreen, Ragged, and Powderhorn. Uh, Fern. We have Vern here. Vern may be on mute. Where's Vern? Vern uh, Greco. Sorry about that. It's oh, the there he is. I forgot to unmute. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a lane change from. Uh, the association's perspectives to operators' perspective, and so you'll uh, you, you'll get some different insights here, and I think uh, some balance, or hopefully some balance. Uh, I'm going to start with my view from about 50,000 feet, and I'm going to do it for the purpose of context more than anything else. Um, these are the conversations that we're having between the five properties across North America, and they're doing their planning uh, with these as some overarching thoughts and principles. One thing I would say uh, to all of us, not just to journalists, but the area operators and, and to our guests and all of us, be aware as the season unfolds of the disconnect between guidelines 
and practicality out on the hill. Those of you that have been around ski areas, or those of you that are, have been operators or been around operators, putting something in writing, issuing a guideline is one thing, getting out on the hill and doing it out there under the, uh, uh, under the pressure of the day-to-day um, goings on is, is a little bit different deal. We feel pretty strongly that there's gonna be uh, strong demand for skiing. And we are moving forward absolutely in that context. We think it's going to be very similar to the outdoor recreation we saw across the country this summer. Golf was up almost beyond description at all of our properties that have golf um, here in the West. You couldn't go to a trailhead that you've typically gone to in previous years and find a parking place, use of the trails, mountain biking, everything to do with outdoor recreation were at record numbers. And we think there'll be a similar level of pent-up demand uh, for skiing. That's supported to a certain extent by season pass sales. Pass sales are up all across the board for us. We've got one property that's flat, but that's flat with a record year, so we feel really good about that. Um, <laughs> we feel pretty confident that international uh, is going to be the most impacted customer sector out there. Little or no international travel uh, is the way that we're calling that right now. We think that's going to be followed by long haul traffic until there's some confidence renewed in air travel. I sat through a, um, uh, a Zoom call similar to this with Arnie Sorensen, who's the CEO of Marriott Hotels uh, earlier this week, and Arnie echoed that loudly, saying long haul air travel is going to be slow to come back. You're going to have to be really patient. That says to us, with small areas that have drive markets, that we may have an advantage and those of you that are uh, that live in or frequent those drive market skiers, as I think we'll, we'll see that. While we think skier demand is going to be pretty strong, we also feel pretty strongly that those ancillary services, primarily food and beverage, are going to be negatively impacted mm -hmm. and we're braced for that. We just think that that's a, uh, a foregone conclusion. Um, similarly, ski school, rentals, retail, uh, stands to reason that those areas are going to be off to the same extent that day ticket sales uh, are going to be off. So those there, those areas that use day ticket sales as a uh, as a governor on traffic or as a capacity restrictor, we we'll probably expect to see the sales in those ancillary areas decline as well. Uh, I would say, and, and it was, I've said this to all of our properties and all of our GMs. Um, we think the trade associations, Ski New Hampshire, Car Ski Country, Canada West Skiers Association, the three that we deal with most directly, have really done a very good job and we're appreciative of the efforts that they have, that they have made on our behalf. Uh, similarly, I would say that NSAA and SAM have been um, proactive and they've been constructive and it's been helpful. Here's the X factor, the way I see it. How much of a surge, not if, but how much of a surge are we going to see in the virus and how much will our collective, this collective group, operators, customers, and government agencies, how much is the experience and the learning curve that we've gained since mid-March going to affect the way we deal with that surge? We're a lot more experienced at this now than we were in March. March was the sledgehammer approach. I'd like to think that we can do something more akin to a scalpel approach when it comes at us this ski season. And we're all going to have to be prepared for that. We're going to have to be nimble on our feet. You know, we've, we've heard from Shan and Adam and Peter, there's very much a conventional wisdom approach out there to certain things. Uh, distancing, masks, the need for good communication, both on site and on the websites, in the publications that you guys all represent and, and contribute to the standard health and safety uh, criteria, mask, wash your hands, use sanitizers, don't come to work if you feel sick. Uh, answer the list of questions. Any of you that had to go in for medical care during this time have been asked that list of questions as you go into the hospital or to the medical office. And it's become so routine and so rote that you almost don't understand the person as they ask you those questions. They just whiz through them. One minute. Uh, online and advanced sales only and contactless transactions. Those are all gonna be in place. I think what's gonna differ from area to area is how we deal with these capacity restrictions. When we first got to thinking about this last spring, when some of the ski areas were trying to get back uh, into business, we thought maybe it was going to be capa uh, 
comfortable carrying capacity restrictions because that's a metric we're all accustomed to dealing with. I don't think that's gonna be the driving metric now. I think the driving metric is going to be the limitations that are put on other facilities. What are the state orders? What are the local public health department orders as they indoor spaces? Base lodges, rental shops, ski school, waiting areas, queuing areas, lift lines, as you heard from the trade associations. I think those are the metrics that are gonna, you know, gonna really come into play. Um, Vern, if you could wrap it up. Yep, as area operators, we're gonna have to pay some really close attention to uh, how we control capacity out there. Do we use reservations or do we not use reservations? Season passes versus day tickets, which one of those is going to be the governor uh, on how we control that capacity? Uh, and then there's a fairly long list of uncertain challenges that we're going to have to learn to deal with. And we're going to probably have to develop those on the fly. Somebody mm -hmm. said it's not going to be the same kind of ski season. I would echo that with a lot of veracity. It's not going to be the same kind of ski season, Paul. Thank you, Vern. Sir. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Reese Brown. He's executive, uh, he is executive director for the Cross Country Ski Areas Association. That group is comprised of 200 members representing 180 touring centers in the US and Canada. Um, and additional members include uh, equipment suppliers, ski area suppliers, consultants, and other businesses associated with the Nordic skiing community. Reese, thanks so much for participating. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start off by just saying that Cross Country is planning, uh, or we are planning on a significant increase in participation this year. Um, to Vern's point, we have been watching very closely what's been going on in cycling, in the outdoor market, uh, hiking, uh, et cetera. And the trailheads where I am here in New England are still packed. There are people absolutely everywhere. So there is a, a desire to be outside that I don't think is changing. Uh, many of the parents of, of kids that I coach are talking about just that ability to get outside because they've got two working parents and one to three kids all working from home. Any opportunity to get outside is a good thing. Um, looking at uh, parameters that are supporting that, um, to Vern's point also, we're seeing significant increases in year over year season pass sales from August and September for those that are selling them in the 100 to 200 to 300 percent increases. And looking at those names, they are for the most part, um, the new names are entry level skiers, people that have not participated before. We're also seeing that at retail, entry level packages in August, which is unheard of for sales are up in the hundreds of percent. So we're feeling extremely bullish with a new group of people coming into cross-country skiing. Um, in terms of COVID, uh, as an organization, we have been working with our members since April uh, with regular Zoom calls talking about uh, the operating elements of the cross-country ski areas uh, and really dissecting every piece of that, much like the Alpine have been doing, to look at new ways to operate, better ways to channel our guests and handle that, uh, um, you know, handle what we've already had, but more importantly, prepare for an increase. Um, and that's something that we feel very, very uh, uh, we feel very confident that it's coming. We're also looking at our revenue silos. Cross country does not have the dollars that Alpine does. So one of the things that is important is that we're not cannibalizing any of our silos for, for dollars in terms of uh, um, you know, preparation or dealing with COVID. We need to keep those silos up. And one of those was ticket sales. Uh, and we talked about this at length. Many people uh, were looking at touchless systems, you know, ways to do everything online. But our cross-country center said we have capacity. We we do not have that um, that uh, that crowded model that many other um, activities do have. So getting that person in inside for a short period of time is really important because they're going to buy ancillary products um, through the retail, possibly lessons, etc excuse me, et cetera. So that was uh, super important. We're also creating messaging around, um, around when to ski. And we have, uh, I think, that ability through our, our, our websites, et cetera, to, to, tell, to suggest to people when to ski. And you know, the general thought is don't be that Saturday skier. 
Um, again, living, living in a mountain community here, we have a tremendous number of people that moved here on March 15th and have stayed. Uh, our school system has seen a significant increase in, uh, uh, in new students um, in the 20% range, 20 to 30% range. So there's a huge number of people here. Um, they're here to stay. You know, as, uh, as Adam mentioned about Vermont, this is a very tough state to come into. Restrictions are very steep. Uh, the people I've spoken to are looking at that and saying, okay, I want to ski. How can I make that happen? So I think people are really thinking about uh, how they're going to participate this year and setting their winter up to accommodate that. Um, we also feel that people are learning, uh, learning how to operate in COVID. Uh, this is a, a, something that I think is very important. We've had flu forever and there is an acceptable level of risk. We now have COVID. There is an acceptable level of risk that people are, are figuring out, like going to the supermarket, like going to the post office. When do you do that? probably not at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So those sorts of things, you know, we're, we're expecting a lot from our guests and we're expecting them to, uh, to follow all of the, all of the, gui the COVID guidelines, mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, and we're gonna push people outside for the most part, uh, just like everyone else. That's gonna be an increasing thing. But we're lucky in that we naturally social distance in the cross country community. Um, our people generally do not come for a full day and stay the entire day with us. They come for a two hour segment going from the car are breezing through the lodge and getting on the trails quickly is something that they're used to uh, and then leaving quickly also. So I, um, we feel that, again, we are uniquely positioned for really a, uh, a significant increase and uh, what could be a great year. Jeff, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to pull it back to you. <laughs> One minute to go. <laughs> you have another minute. You have another minute. Um, you know, one of the things that was uh, interesting to, to a few of our areas when they closed down in March of last year, uh, there were at least two of our ski areas that were deemed essential mm -hmm. businesses for the uh, physical and mental well-being of their community. So that's something that we are keeping in our back pocket if things do get tight. Um, we have provisions to operate our ski areas uh, from a staff perspective in silos. Uh, having groomers that operate one machine only, nobody else goes into that. So that is a clean environment, so to speak. Uh, likewise with, uh, with the other pieces of our business. Again, we don't deal with the volume that many Alpine uh, ski areas deal with. We don't, we're not based on that kind of, uh, uh, on that model at all. So we're more able to adapt quickly to, to what will happen. We do realize that day one, everything is going to change. And we know that we have multiple contingencies and we're looking forward to a great year. Thank you. Thank you, Reese. Um, our next uh, last is uh, Ski Utah, Annalise Bergen, Director of Marketing and Digital Communications. And uh, Utah's the location for the Western Winter Summit. We've got our fingers crossed that we can still hold that in late January. The Utah Ski and Snowboard Association, it's a nonprofit founded in 1975 with the aim of promoting Utah's ski and snowboard industry. And it represents all 15 ski resorts in Utah. Um, all, they're all downhill, but some have uh, cross country as well. And Annalise. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just share my screen with this presentation and um, apparently everybody wants to be on the internet this evening, so just wave wildly if I'm cutting out and I will uh, turn off my video as well. Um, but for now, um, I have my snowy background because I'm can channeling some snow because um, we're supposed to get some this Sunday. Um, alrighty, one moment. Okay, so. Um, as mentioned, we, uh, we have 15 resorts here in Utah that are all members of Ski Utah. We're really grateful to have all of them working together really well this season. Um, if you want a screenshot with some fun facts, here you go, or reach out, and I can send this to you. Um, so just to go over one, you know, one really helpful resource for all of you is if you go to skiutah.com forward slash COVID-19, this is where I have gathered pretty much everything you would need to know about skiing in Utah this winter. And this is going to be real time updated as soon as we receive information from resorts. Um, 
This has a lot of details about safety and operations, ski area advantages, passes, um, weather and snow links as well, just um, a quick spot as long as, and as well as a really big FAQ section. Um, and so, you know, we really leaned on NSAA's recommended guidelines around the Ski Well Be Well project. Um, and <clears throat> Utah's resorts were able to create a really consistent set of safety standards for this upcoming winter season. Um, and they really have been some local leaders around creating some of the safety standards. They've been open this summer um, with really safe operations. And um, our local health officials are, are confident that they're going to open and they're going to stay open. Um, a Park City health official was just on um, local radio the other day actually stating that. Um, so I'm really proud of our resorts and how hard they've worked to make sure we get to open and ski this winter. <laughs> um, this table I know is a little small. It's actually a screenshot from this web page. So if you're looking for this table, just go ahead and go to skiutah.com. Um, forward slash COVID-19. Um, all 15 of our ski areas are scheduled to open this November. Um, there's a few changes, um, as you see, just listed on here that are helpful to know. Um, Park City Mountain will require reservations um, for pass holders, and a lot of the ski resorts will be requiring a lift ticket purchase. Um, parking reservations will be required at Snowbird, um, and many ski areas may have limited parking. Um, it will be monitored at several ski areas. Um, Snowbird's aerial tram will be operating at 25% capacity, um, and Snow Basin and Park City Mountain will be operating their gondolas um, at reduced capacity and are with only same party riders. Um, so obviously similar to what we're seeing in the other ski areas, but um, specific to Utah, those, those changes with the tram and, um, and the gondolas are important to note. Um, and then statewide across all of our ski resorts. Face coverings are going to be required. Physical distancing will be required. All ski resorts are going to load guests on lifts in the same parties or um, if the lift allows the people to be spaced out if they're single skiers, um, they could, you know, for example, on a four pack lift be sitting on either side of the, of the lift. Um, so I'm kind of rushing through these pretty fast, um, but uh, with the notes that Jeff gave me about things to talk about, um, I want to talk about a few things that don't change. Let's all talk about some happy things. Some um, things never change in Utah. One of that is snow. <laughs> we're going to get snow. We're going to always get snow, and it's always going to be the greatest snow on earth. Colorado might try to tell you that they have better snow, but they don't. We have the greatest snow on earth, and it's a proven fact. Um, so, <laughs> and I'll argue it till the day I die. <laughs> um, so we, you know, 19 Utah powder days with at least 12 inches of snow every season, 34 Utah powder days with at least six inches of snow. Those are our annual averages. And mm. if you've been here and if you skied it, you know. Um, it's unlike anything else on earth. And guess what? It's coming and get again this year, whether coronavirus is here or not, and we're gonna be skiing it. So um, that's something <laughs> happy to look at. Um, and it's something else that we're really, you know, we're just so lucky here in Utah is the proximity and access of our resorts. Um, so there's 10 ski resorts in under an hour from the airport. Um, we'll technically maybe call it 11 because Powder Mountain is like 67 minutes. So I like to give them an honorable mention. Um, <laughs> and then, we have five resorts on the Icon Pass, two resorts on the Epic Pass. Um, and I understand a lot of people aren't necessarily going to want to be flying, even though they should um, feel comfortable flying into our beautiful new airport that I'll talk about later. Um, but this is a ski road trip heaven here. Um, they're not just close to the airport, they're close to each other. So something to keep in mind. Um, a quick overview of what's new. Reach out to me if you want some more specifics. but. Um, the new Salt Lake City Airport opened its first phase this fall, and they're opening even more this, um, this next week. And it's a $4.1 billion project, and I actually think that number is climbing. And it is gorgeous, it's open, it's amazing. So as soon as you're ready to fly, fly into it. Um, here's a quick summary of just, just some highlights around what's new. Nordic Valley, which is a really fun little hometown resort outside of Eden, Utah, is actually putting in its first high-speed lift opening additional acreage. Snowbird is um, launching a new app that's real-time lift status, trail status, ski tracking, push notifications. Woodward, with, um, which is our newest resort, is opening with contactless ordering and contactless ticketing for tubing. Powder Mountain is gonna have pop-up food and drink shacks that are really cool. Some of them are gonna be hard to find and fun to go around and find. Snow Basin is adding new yurts for warming um, and adding <laughs> food. 
Um, and then Eagle Point is um, still continuing their As You Wish program, which is getting very big popularity because you can rent the whole ski resort for just yourself or your family or your uh, or your group. So that's a really cool thing too. So that was a really mm -hmm. quick overview of what's new. There's obviously a ton. Screenshot this if you want to reach out to me, Annalise at SkiUtah.com or head to that website and make sure you sign up um, for our emails because I will send you news notifications, press releases, and you'll know right away when something cool is happening in Utah, including whenever we get Fun. No. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, our final presenter is uh, Jody uh, Bichurich. Jody is representing uh, Vail Resorts. VR, um, of course, is uh, the global mountain resort operator with 37 resorts in 15 states and three countries. And Jody uh, is vice president, general manager for Keystone. She previously was uh, chief operating officer for Woodward Camps at Powder. Jody, thanks for joining us and wrapping up our session here. All right. Well, thank you for having me, and I will be responsible about the timing. I know we have uh, a debate all to get to, but thanks for having me. Um, I will echo much of what uh, a couple of you have said in advance. While things will look different this season, um, the exciting news is we are going to have a ski season, so we are striving. Uh, to be out front and really thoughtful as we head into this season. And it is our goal and design. Um, we've designed an approach that can remain in place for all of the season. We don't want to be caught off guard or find ourselves needing to make reactionary changes. We are striving for consistency across our resorts um, and it will provide for our guests, employees and those communities with as much predictability as possible this season which we believe will be worth it, um, that, that extra effort. Um, we're looking forward to kicking off the season here at Keystone, where I am, um, with our planned opening on uh, November 6th. Uh, it is Keystone's 50th anniversary. I'd love to point that out. We're gonna celebrate with a big <laughs> birthday party this year. And we're focused on three key major priorities. The safety of our guests, our employees, and the community having a successful season from start to finish, and prioritizing our pass holders. Face masks will be required in every part of our operation without exception. All elements of our operations are being reimagined with safety and physical distancing in mind. A few examples include our dining, rental, and ski school operations. Dining. In addition to our dining facility safety protocols, capacity management and reservations may be required at many of our on-mountain dining facilities. And the food options in our quick service restaurants will be more limited this season with just a handful of ready to go hot and cold options to help manage the flow of our services. Ski schools class sizes will be managed and face coverings will be required and all ski and ride school participants will be required to complete a pre-arrival self-health screening on the day of their lesson. Rentals, we will be managing the number of people inside our rental properties in accordance with local guidance and setting them up um, to allow for physical distancing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive in to now into um, a reservation system, which will be in place to manage um, the number of people in, uh, to manage access to our mountains, prioritizing our pass holders. We believe that for the vast majority of those days, guests will be able to ski and ride on the days they want, but we're planning for all days in contingencies, weekend powder days, holidays, and the like. Early season access will be reserved for pass holders. Lift tickets will go on sale December 8th. Mm -hmm. Reservations for guests to ski Keystone in the early season will open on November 4th. So on November 6th, guests will be um, able to begin reserving their seven priority re reservation days for the core season, December 8th through April 4th, across all of our resorts. Pass holders can make as many week of reservations as their pass type and availability will allow. Our Primary safety protocols and new operating procedures will be consistent 
across all of our resorts so guests will know what to expect and how to prepare whether they're visiting Keystone or Stowe or any of the Vail Mountains. So that fairly wraps up um, the enterprise. Uh, we tried to keep it uh, concise because we're, we're really talking about an enterprise of over 30 resorts. Um, so I'll open it up. I wanted to make sure to save a little bit of time so that we can have a, a question and answers, Jeff. That's great. And uh, thanks so much. I'll, I'll uh, before I turn it over to our media panelists, I'll uh, <laughs> ask you a question um, which comes in from Charlie Sanders and that is uh, what was the experience with Parisher in Australia? Jody. Yeah so our experience with Parisher was a great I mean it was wonderful for us to be able to learn um, from all the experiences I think one of the key takeaways was the um, the structure of the reservation system and getting that up and running and being able to really learn about the patterns um, of how that reservation system and I think that really sets us up for North America and to head into the season having knowledge about how that reservation system functioned. Thank you. MP and Mara. Mm -hmm. Take over on the questions. Okay. I'll, I'll go first Mara. We had a question because we had a ton. So thank you all. You've been really uh, detailed in your presentation, but we have a lot of questions. We'll see how many we can get to. So past Najdeh president, who's not on the call tonight, he was uh, asking about the capacity restriction change to the snowmaking strategy, meaning that if you plan to spread out skiers and have to run um, more lifts, he goes, how do, um, will you make less snow on a larger number of trails? And how, how will you manage capacity? So he didn't ask a specific person, but I would throw it to Ski Vermont, please. Adam, can you unmute? I can, I'm sorry, I was answering another question. Oh, uh, sorry. In the chat. Um, I've been so, answering those all along there. I, I hate oh. the question, but. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know people are in the chat, but we have the list and we'll throw them out. But some people, some of you ask questions in the chat, just so you know, they didn't ask for a specific hill to, or region to answer, so we can throw them, so make sure everybody gets questions. So how will you manage the snowmaking strategy to spread people out and open more lifts and uh, like, will that affect your strategy and how do you determine capacity? I know it's each operations, but can you give a, a general answer for Vermont? Yeah, the, uh, the answer to the snowmaking uh, portion mm -hmm. is that there is no talk at all of limitation on the mountain itself. Uh, the limitations will occur in the base lodge, as far as base lodge capacity and uh, so anything that requires social distancing. I mean, anyone who's been to a ski area knows that on the mountain itself, on the trails, social distancing doesn't tend to be as much of an issue. So I don't think that there's necessarily gonna be uh, a change in philosophy when it comes to terrain. The ski areas in Vermont always try to have as much terrain open as possible at all times. And it's not like they could uh, suddenly in response to this, rapidly increase their snowmaking capability or coverage and have a lot more terrain open. So I don't think you're gonna see differences there. And as far as the, the capacity limitations, I think here, again, subject to approval, you're gonna see generally the rule is gonna be six feet of physical distancing, which is kind of the societal norm, and or a 50% capacity. So 50% lodge capacity, 50% um, lift capacity, uh, with the exception of people in the same traveling party will be able, uh, allowed to ride together. But aside from that, the norm will generally be 50% capacity. So honestly, I think with that and with the with the di all the distancing measures in place, you're going to see natural spread on the hill. Thank you. Maura, do you want to ask the, the next question? Sure, I probably need to put my glasses on. <laughs> if um, not, I can, I can do another one if you want. <laughs> so, go ahead. Are you there? Maura just froze. Okay, I'll uh, ask another question for, uh, from Roger. The reservation for lift tickets, we already touched base. I know, I think the season passes are up across North America from numbers we've seen. The reservation for lift tickets, uh, how do you determine, uh, did you boost um, capacity to make sure the systems don't crash? Because some people in Australia, New Zealand, 
were online for hours and they didn't get the, the days they wanted. So that I would throw maybe to, uh, to Vail and also to, uh, to Canadian Ski Council, please. I'll go ahead and jump into the best of my ability. Um, so we have been working on our, our technology and really um, have learned a lot through the process. Um, and so, you know, the details of how the reservations are working that I, I went through that. But uh, I would say that we have learned a lot through the process, especially through our season pass process and our, have worked through the waiting room and um, are really pushing hard um, as we unfold uh, in early November. Um, but we feel really ready and excited to roll out the reservation system. And Paul, and for Canada, any news on big websites? I know Quebec has one too for reserver. We have good uh, Wi-Fi in the with the Moose Country, right? Uh, well, yes, we do. But the <laughs> you know the, I, I think I'd like to point out that seasons pass reservations are not a universal thing across uh, Canadian ski areas. Uh, but certainly, the the word that we have is that all of our resorts have e-commerce priorities. Uh, for tickets and uh, and for a few for passes, uh, our focus has been on making sure that uh, that we can reduce uh, transaction time. So that's part of the gov uh, the government uh, recommendations. Keep those uh, those face to face transactions to a minimum, or preferably eliminate them altogether. And so we're going to see big investment at uh, in RFID and uh, and touchless and trans and humanless te uh, technologies across the ski industry. Uh, I'll be prefacing a little bit of, of what Eve might want to say, but between the Canadian Ski Council and the uh, ASSQ in Quebec, we're hard at work developing a seasons pass reservation and ticket e-commerce system with validation that's built onto the, uh, the platform that we share in order to execute our snowpass. So we saw a need back in, in May to, to start prepping this and we've advanced that what we call a phase two plan that was supposed to happen next year uh, into this year, we'll be able to offer e-commerce to smaller resorts uh, that may require it. Thank you. Maura, are you back? Hopefully I won't freeze this. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'm ready. I'm reading the no same. Idea. So I'm going to merge a couple of questions into one because they're all kind of going the same way. And we'll throw this over to New Hampshire since we just spoke with Vermont a few moments ago. So it really looks like there's a trend of more people heading out and that could be a lot of new people to the sport and that means beginners and that means usually group lessons. So how are we going to handle that kind of influx of beginner lessons if it comes this season? Uh, thanks for the question, Maria. Uh, I haven't seen too many specifics. That's definitely a resort for resort. And, um, you know, we are targeting known audiences and new audiences on social media from the Ski New Hampshire and Department of Tourism perspective, some that are just generally winter. It, because we want people to know before they go whether or not they're going skiing or they're coming up to uh, go to our restaurants or with lodging. There's a lot of restrictions to take into account when you go on vacation in general. Uh, with that said, I can say I have had a few discussions with some ski areas and they're looking into some different types of lessons. So no one's getting rid of learn to programs. You know, we want people to come and to go skiing. Uh, they are going to need to go online and reserve those in advance. And they might look a little different. You're right, we won't be seeing those large group numbers anymore. What you're likely gonna see is some more interesting offerings. Like I've heard of some Skiria's offering a family lesson, which sounds pretty awesome, especially for the littles who actually get to go skiing or learn to ski and have a parent or a sibling um, come with them, which I think sounds a little bit more fun than just sort of sending them off for the day. And then another option is sort of friend lessons or those small group lessons, but you, the people would sort of know each other in advance. Um, and then also private lessons will also be mm. something that's just sort of generally already done. Um, so I don't, I don't know that anyone will be offering large group lessons in general. I do know that there will be some seasonal programs and different things, but that's not really a learn to scenario specifically. And, um, and I don't really know how that's going down. Um, that would definitely be a resort specific question. 
Mm -hmm. I, I realize follow up, we do have Ragged Mountain, which may be the king of lessons on here. Are you still here? Anything you can share on this topic or? Yeah, need? sure. Hi, Maura. Nice there to you see are. You. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll echo what, what Shannon said there. There's no effort that I'm aware of to throttle back on the, uh, on the Learn 2 programs in New Hampshire in general, but are Ragged specifically. There are some specific tactics or methodologies that we'll employ to do that. And, and I think you've seen one of them. And that is uh, on days when we have large numbers of people at the resort, we'll probably revert to some station teaching as opposed to the traditional group lesson format. For those of you that aren't familiar, familiar with station teaching, it's really a, a, a flow at your own pace kind of deal. You can show up anytime you want. It doesn't have to be a nine o'clock lesson or a 10 o'clock lesson. Uh, you show up when you want, you get your rental equipment, as soon as you walk out the door, you'll be met by an instructor and you'll be entered into the program and you'll flow from station to station that are manned by instructors. So people can learn and move at their own pace and you completely avoid the group format. Um, clearly class sizes, as Shannon said, are gonna be limited. You're not gonna see eight to 10 people to group sizes uh, in lessons this year. They're gonna be much smaller than that. And we're gonna try very hard to make the numbers in those lessons plus the instructor fit some of the lift loading guidelines, which is gonna be one of the most difficult Rubik's cubes to solve out on the hill, quite frankly. So that, that's a couple of ways that we'll deal with, uh, with lessons. Thank you so much. So we have a question for more of the larger destination resorts. So maybe the, the West um, Division, is there's a concern with the lack of uh, having foreigners to work at the ski hills. Do you have staffing issue? One of the things I'd like to address is the CSIA, I don't know, they're members of the Canadian Ski Council, but they said that 50% forecast uh, less lessons were, were, was done this summer and they ended up running out of ski instructors. So who could be representing larger destination where they're gonna, usually they depend on foreign Australian and workers and how are you planning the staffing uh, issue this year? So do you have a, uh, an association that could take that on, please? MP, I can speak for, for Canada, in particular for yeah. Canada's West, it's Paul. Uh, you know, the, the, the human resources challenge in Canadian ski areas is, is, is not abated. It, it is going to be a bit exacerbated this year by uh, the lack of, of offshore workers. Uh, we spent the first few months trying to work with the federal government here in Canada to get those exemptions, and that those exemptions are not forthcoming. Uh, but in the meantime, I have to commend many of our resorts uh, in the destination class who have gone out and really gone back to square one with recruitment and have managed to fill. And in some cases, uh, resorts in the Okanagan Valley have, have potentially oversubscribed their, uh, their employee recruitment, which is uh, almost unheard of in this day and age. So I, I think we're seeing... Uh, maybe it's a little bit of uh, a little bit of job displacement where people are able to now come back and work at resorts yeah. for winter season, but uh, definitely, uh, definitely will remain a challenge. Thank you, Maura. Do you have the next one? I do. I feel so old putting classes. <laughs> so two questions into one again. Um, how are resorts forecasting this winter? Up steady or down and what did seasons past sales tell you about the customer mood um i guess who do you think Vale? who hasn't spoken yet yeah <laughs> i've lost track i'd like Vale to answer that because you guys have spread right if you don't mind you're on mute jody. or keystone yeah <laughs> jody you're on mute Sorry, there we go. Um, I think, you know, to summarize, it was, was, it was spoken about in our investor call and really pleased, given the challenging environment and with COVID, um, you know, we are very pleased with the results of season pass sales to date. And season pass sales through September, you know, units were up 18%. So uh, that's a great, great sign of things to come. Um, we had a really ex uh, Great summer, successful summer, and I think those are indicators, right? They're trends to look at um, as we look forward. So I think in a nutshell, um, 
people are excited to get back out on the hill. Many of, many of the people who have spoken today have talked about the great success of what we did see, um, people getting in the outdoors. And we're just so lucky that we have the opportunity to spread people out on our mountains. Um, and so we're, we're really fortunate in, the, in this industry that we have that ability. So all, all arrows are pointing in the right direction. Thank you. So I have one from Sean Setner. He asks, what are the Eastern resorts, so that could be Canada or, or USA, envisioning for uphill policies in light of other COVID restrictions? There'll be a, a big uproar of um, touring and going off piece. So some hills like here in Quebec, Trombla has a small fee, but we'd like to throw it to East. So um, Vermont or New Hampshire or Quebec? <laughs> uh, Who's unmuted? I could I could start off with that one at least. Um, Thank you. The backcountry scene here in Vermont is incredibly vibrant and a lot of it is completely off the resorts and so we think uh, there's going to be a ton of interest in exploring a lot of these trail networks that have really nothing to do with resorts. Uh, interestingly we do have a member Bolton Valley who's doing season leases on backcountry gear even when the local shops are not able to do that so the interest is certainly there. And uh, we anticipate it is going to be strong. There has not been any talk of limiting uphill travel, Sean, uh, during the season. In fact, I think a lot of it has to do, as you know, uphill doesn't really heat up until after the lift stops spinning in the in the spring. So that's when yeah. I think it will become a lot more of an issue. I think a lot of those people, like I said, they either ski off the resort completely or they're actually doing lift surf while the lifts are running during the season. Thank you. Anybody uh, else want? Hmm? I will. I would mirror everything Adam says, and then um, I would also welcome people to make sure that they're looking at ski area policies before they venture out to any ski area, um, because they might not be necessarily limiting uphill, but they might be changing some of the policies with um, uphill traffic. Thank you. Yeah, I'll add just one thing to that too. We've talked about it at length at, at Ragged Mountain because they see some demand from uphill skiing. We don't see the uphill skier contributing at all to our capacity issues. If you think about who that uphill skier is, the time of day that they arrive, where they are on the mountain, we just think that they are a non-issue. They're typically going to arrive early in the day. They travel in small packs or tribes. They're going to go uphill so they're not crowding the lifts. Um, they're typically not inside in the restaurants, so we're going to encourage uphill, not make any sort of restrictive policies there. I do have a couple of GMs that say, yeah, but Vern, I take parking places away from full paying skiers. I said, yeah. lose it. <laughs> well, let's welcome them to go on, on the hill. So there, there won't be any restrictions from our perspective on uphill. Thank you. Uh, it's funny, I have a lot of questions on portable bathrooms because I think we uh, we have places where not a lot of people will have access. And a question I would combine into that one is with the parking places that will kind of force people to put their ski boots on, let's say you're two miles or two kilometers uh, from the lodge, there's a safety issue to walking in ski boots and having to go to the bathroom and all that. So has that been addressed as a safety thing? Because they won't be able to to hop on the shuttle. I was suggesting limousines, but I think people will have to walk carrying their equipment further down. So maybe there's a security issue we can address. So who wants to take that one? For those who are, we cannot put our boots and leave the bags in, uh, in the lodge, like in Quebec, especially in the red zone. Eve, maybe you? Um, Eve, you know? Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Maxa, for your question. Actually, um, I wasn't uh, raising my hand because I'm not too sure how <laughs> it's going to be handled at the resort level. Um, and with the policy that's been announced last week, uh, many of the ski areas are reviewing that right now, you know, bringing mm -hmm. uh, uh, bags inside and uh, changing inside. And since the, the chalets, the ski lodges will be used as uh, shelters in red zones, I mm -hmm. think there will be more accommodation than, than restrictions. So more bathrooms and, uh, and things and restaurant options and, as well. Uh, added like uh, big tops, uh, heated tents outdoors to make sure that there's enough space so that people can, uh, can actually walk up uh, to the lodge and change and 
we'll, we'll see more amenities, temporary amenities being added to the ski areas. Thank you. I was, I was joking. I said, we should all sell some little cat tracks. Remember those from the eighties to not slip in our, in our boots. Maybe they'll come back. So Maura, back to you. There are a number of questions that sort of come at this from different angles, but they all yeah. boil down to one thing. Um, how will you enforce the COVID restrictions that you have in place? Things like masking and social distancing and all those things. How exactly will you enforce them? Cause that's, Kind of hard, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone want to volunteer? Well, I'm happy to speak to it. We, uh, we certainly went through that this summer, right? Uh, we experienced it and um, all of our staff will be trained um, when they return to work. There will be an extensive training on service and how to um, manage that. And, and we are going to have uh, very strict guidelines around it. You won't be able to access the mountain without a face covering. So um, that's the basics of it. There will be a lot of signage. Um, I can guarantee you inside gondola cabins and in plazas and areas um, making everyone aware um, of face coverings. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's questions on events, but uh, I know some of the answers for covering Fis Alpine, if there will ever be big events for this year, maybe in the U.S., but I know in Canada, every international race has been, uh, has been canceled. So there's um, four bags. Like, I, you've, you've sent in a lot of great questions. That's good. So maybe, Jeff, we could also list them and, and uh, the speakers can answer them after all if we don't get to all of them. Well, I'll also provide, well, we have time for a few more questions. Right. Uh, I will also provide a list of contacts. Contact so for, so for, yeah, that'll be perfect. So quick question is, as far as the actual mask go, I know some face coverings that we use for skiing usually have holes for nose and breathing. So the, so those neoprene masks, so that will not be considered a um, safe issue unless you're just skiing with it. But what are you considering a face mask for, uh, for the lift line? Let's say I don't see myself wearing a little blue medical mask in the lift line. Um, do you want to take it where it's cold? One of the regions, please. Do we, did we hear from uh, people in Vermont or? Yeah, we uh, or Utah. Yeah, we we anticipate policing of the mask and face covering policy itself, but not necessarily. People aren't going to be checking people's masks, like oh. pulling buffs off and being like, "Is this double layer or is this thick?" <laughs> the people who aren't wearing masks are the ones who are going to get the attention, not the people who are wearing masks. So, honestly, face coverings of any type, I think you're going to be okay. Um, is the short answer there? Thank you. Well, I think that's of great concern because if you show up and you have a, a, a buff, mm -hmm. which is not a surgical mask, uh, are, you are you compliant? Or do you have to have a medical mask underneath uh, your buff? Here in Utah, um, like for example, in Park City specifically, so um, Park City and Summit County issued an order that just a buff was not enough for their face coverings. And they, for example, so Woodward Park City um, throughout their summer operations indoors, those that were wearing masks, if you chose to wear a buff, you had to double it up. So, so if it was a thin, you know, traditional, very thin buff, you are required to fold it up in half. Um, most of the people here out in Utah, especially on those cold days, are wearing those buffs anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would expect that a lot of them will gladly double them over when they get down to the lift line. Um, and this may be the extra optimist in me that was born for the ski industry, but I believe that all of our skiers want to ski. And so I, I am optimistic about the fact that if the communication is very clear and the, um, and the verbiage is kind to one another and that we ask, ask everyone to comply and be very clear about it, that 99.99% .99 of skiers will gladly fold their buff up in half and because they want to keep skiing. I want to keep skiing. Everyone wants to keep skiing. Um, and so our ski resorts are leaning on whatever their local guidelines are and in constant communication with their local health officials and then immediately adjusting theirs or requiring theirs to be even higher. Um, and so ski resorts are pretty going to be very strict about that here too, but I have a feeling that 
asking nicely a couple times will gladly change anyone's mind because everyone wants to keep skiing. Uh, that, that was my observation in the spring. I skied uh, three days in late April, May at Baldy and, and one at A Basin after that. And uh, uh, we were all willing, wearing those blue surgical masks and most people were. And, uh, you know, and, and, and people were compliant. We were very grateful to be skiing at all under the circumstances. Uh, you know, the, the, the surgical mask may be a, a little problematic if it's cold and wet, <laughs> but in the spring, they, they work just fine. Um, I'd like to wrap this up at 8.30 Eastern, so it gives us about eight minutes for more questions. Maura? So the new to it decide even a week before, a couple weeks before, skier doesn't have a season's pass of any kind, wants to go for a day. How difficult is it going to be to make that happen? Will there be a shortage of spots? And how will resorts message out to that new market in how to get out and be able to do it? And how about Ski New Hampshire for that one? Because that's where I would drive to. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we want to encourage them to come here. The first point of our messaging is know before you go, you know, plan ahead, which uh, we would hope that some first timers would be doing is just sort of researching um, on either using skiNH.com or ski area specific websites to figure out what they need to do. Um, and I would further recommend, I mean, I think New Hampshire will be, will be pretty accessible. You know, we have so many different types of ski areas. Uh, we have small ski areas and let's not forget cross country skiing. You know, we have 15 of our ski areas are Nordic skiing resorts. So there's a, there's a lot of variety in all the different states to choose from. So um, there might be issues during those holiday periods um, on some weekend periods but uh, we're trying to do what we can to encourage midweek skiing and then um, to encourage the sort of those non-holidays, non I guess, change some people's behaviors when looking to go skiing. Obviously, if you're a never ever a first timer, um, you might not even think that's a problem. And so we're just hoping that uh, ski areas will have some, some language on their websites that might speak to it, at least when they're coming up to different um, high volume weekends and different things and we will on our ski our website have some language that points to that and we just have to all sort of work together to be transparent and try to communicate as much as we can. Yeah, Maura, it's Vern here. Let, let me add to that just a little bit and Shannon did a really good job of characterizing that in the case of New Hampshire but at Ragged Mountain for instance and this is important for people to know and we'll message this out there's really a very small number of days that are in jeopardy of being capacity restricted. In the case of Ragged Mountain, I and mean, I'll share an actual number with you, when we've gone back and we've modeled the last three years and looked at how many people we had on the hill on those days, there's only 12 days of the year that we think might be capacity restricted. Those other days are gonna be open for skiing. And so if you don't have a season pass and you wanna be able to buy, you wanna buy a day ticket, you're gonna be able to go online, get to the online store, and buy that ticket with relative ease. We will get in front of that message for those 12 days and well in advance of that, characterize those days as potentially restricted days and to buy your, your day ticket well in advance. But we'll have stop sales on numbers on those days, but really only 12 days for you at Ragged that you might be in jeopardy of being blacked out. Good news, thank you. Thank you. Maybe one uh, final question from my side. It'll be like a lot of people are worried about spending good money and traveling and being locked down or not being able to enjoy their past. I know it's been really hard for many resorts uh, to have to refund tickets last year and you're offering less product. My question is uh, from other people too combining. It's uh, did you have, did, did resorts have to buy some kind of insurance? You know, like I, when you buy an icon or an Epic pass or a mountain collective, how do you handle all these refund requests and how can we as journalists manage those expectations and help you convey that the expectations? I know that we've said it all tonight. No, before you go check with the exact resort you're going to, but is there is that's the mood right now is a lot of people are concerned that we don't know what's going to happen in two months as best as our intentions are tonight. 
So who would like to answer uh, or give their thoughts as final thoughts? I'll, I'll, start, I'll just say, I'll say the vast majority of ski areas out there have adopted some sort of non-char, no cost deferral program. Okay. Almost every ski area out there now says to a season pass holder, if you buy a pass, you have up until a predetermined date to make the decision that you can mm -hmm. defer that pass into the next season at no additional cost, regardless of what happens with the price of next year's pass. Um, the, that business plan has changed for almost everybody. And there's a pretty user-friendly system out there that I would say, and, and Jody can, can, can weigh in here, but I, I think it's pretty universal across the country. There's deferral programs that makes the risk really pretty low for almost every buyer. Thank you. Not only across the country, but across North America, Vernon. Yeah, I think um, that's right. We have a, re a, a Quebec-wide policy for refund until December 1st or 15, depending on the ski area for the season guaranteed. Uh, so as a result, you have Le Massif that is already sold out for season pass. They want to save oh. some space for lift tickets. Uh, well. You have 40% increases in your neck of the woods in the Ottawa region, Magica. So yeah. <laughs> uh, that policy is working out. And for lessons um, uh, in Socialist uh, Canada, we have the <laughs> Consumer Protection Act. So people who purchase in advance will be refunded. Well, and an interesting side part take of too, up until this point, the demand for deferrals is really very low. Now, we'll see what happens as we get a little bit closer to the deadline dates and whatever the weather does, but so far, demand for deferrals has been a non-issue. I've set up the okay, time. We're, we're, uh, we're at 90 minutes now. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank everyone. We had uh, 53 um, members. <laughs> participated in this, which I think was great. Thank our you. thanks to the presenters, our media panel, and our NASDAQ press members for helping us all gain information that we need to communicate about the details of this <laughs> extraordinary you. year for North American snow sports enthusiasts. I, I can't wait for the day when we can all get together again in person and, and take some runs. So until then, um, stay healthy and contact me and I'll send the contact list out. So thanks everybody for participating. Now go Thank you. The debate. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. I look forward to the recording. Thank you. Take care guys. Thanks Jeff. <laughs>